What I Saw of Shiloh 1. This is a simple story of a battle, such a tale as may be told by a soldier who is no writer to a reader who is no soldier. The morning of Sunday, the 6th day of April, 1862, was bright and warm. Reveille had been sounded rather late, for the troops, wearied with long marching, were to have a day of rest. The men were idling about the embers of their bivouac fires, some preparing breakfast, others looking carelessly to the condition of their arms and accoutrements, against the inevitable inspection. Still others were chatting with indolent dogmatism on that never-failing theme, the end and object of the campaign. Sentinels paced up and down the confused front with the lounging freedom of mane and stride that would not have been tolerated at another time. A few of them limped unsoldierly in deference to blistered feet. At a little distance in the rear of the stacked arms were a few tents, out of which frowsy-headed officers occasionally peered, languidly calling to their servants to fetch a basin of water, dust a coat, or polish a scabbard. Trim young mounted orderlies, bearing dispatches, obviously unimportant, urged their lazy nags by devious ways amongst the men, enduring with unconcern their good-humored raillery, the penalty of superior station. Little negroes of not very clearly defined status and function lulled on their stomachs, kicking their long bare heels in the sunshine, or slumbering peacefully, unaware of the practical waggery prepared by white hands for their undoing. Presently the flag, hanging limp and lifeless at headquarters, was seen to lift itself spiritedly from the staff. At the same instant was heard a dull, distant sound, like the heavy breathing of some great animal below the horizon. The flag had lifted its head to listen. There was a momentary lull in the home of the human swarm. Then, as the flag drooped, the hush passed away. But there were some hundreds more men on their feet than before some thousands of hearts beating with a quicker pulse. Again the flag made a warning sign, and again the breeze bore to our ears the long, deep sighing of iron lungs. The division, as if it had received the sharp word of command, sprang to its feet and stood in groups at attention. Even the little blacks got up. I have since seen similar effects produced by earthquakes. I am not sure, but the ground was trembling then. The mess cooks, wise in their generation, lifted the steaming camp kettles off the fire and stood by to cast out. The mounted orderlies had somehow disappeared. Officers came ducking from beneath their tents and gathered in groups. Headquarters had become a swarming hive. The sound of the great guns now came in regular throbbings. The strong, full pulse of the fever of battle. The flag flapped excitedly shaking out its blazonry of stars and stripes with a sort of fierce delight. Toward the knot of officers in its shadow, dashed from somewhere, he seemed to have burst out of the camp in a cloud of dust, a mounted aide-de-camp, and on the instant rose the sharp, clear notes of a bugle, caught up and repeated, and passed on by other bugles, until the level reaches of brown fields, the line of woods trending away to far hills, and the unseen valleys beyond were telling of the sound. The farther, fainter strains, half drowned in ringing ears as the men ran to range themselves behind the stacks of arms. For this call was not the wearisome general before which the tents go down. It was the exhilarating assembly, which goes to the heart as wine and stirs the blood like the kisses of a beautiful woman. Who that has heard it calling to him above the grumble of great guns can forget the wild intoxication of its music? 2. The Confederate forces in Kentucky and Tennessee had suffered a series of reverses, culminating in the loss of Nashville. The blow was severe. Immense quantities of war material had fallen to the victor, together with all the important strategic points. General Johnston withdrew Beauregard's army to Corinth, in northern Mississippi, where he hoped so to recruit and equip it as to enable it to assume the offensive and retake the lost territory. The town of Corinth was a wretched place, the capital of a swamp. It is a two-day's march west of the Tennessee River, 
which here and for a hundred and fifty miles farther, to where it falls into the Ohio at Paducah, runs nearly north. It is navigable to this point, that is to say, to Pittsburgh Landing, where Corinth got to it by a road worn through a thickly wooded country, seamed with ravines and bayous, rising nobody knows where, and running into the river under sylvan arches, heavily draped with Spanish moss. In some places they were obstructed by fallen trees. The Corinth Road was at certain seasons a branch of the Tennessee River. Its mouth was Pittsburgh Landing. Here in 1862 were some fields and a house or two. Now there are a National Cemetery and other improvements. It was at Pittsburgh Landing that Grant established his army, with a river in his rear and two toy steamboats as a means of communication with the east side, whither General Buell, with 30,000 men, was moving from Nashville to join him. The question has been asked, why did General Grant occupy the enemy's side of the river in the face of a superior force before the arrival of Buell? Buell had a long way to come. Perhaps Grant was weary of waiting. Certainly Johnston was. For in the gray of the morning of April 6th, when Buell's leading division was in bivouac near the little town of Savannah, eight or ten miles below, the Confederate forces, having moved out of Corinth two days before, fell upon Grant's advance brigades and destroyed them. Grant was at Savannah, but hastened to the landing in time to find his camps in the hands of the enemy, and the remnants of his beaten army cooped up with an impassable river at their backs for moral support. I have related how the news of this affair came to us at Savannah. It came on the wind, a messenger that does not bear copious details. 3. On the side of the Tennessee River, over against Pittsburgh Landing, are some low, bare hills, partly enclosed by a forest. In the dusk of the evening of April 6, this open space, as seen from the other side of the stream, whence, indeed, it was anxiously watched by thousands of eyes, to many of which it grew dark long before the sun went down, would have appeared to have been ruled in long, dark lines, with new lines being constantly drawn across. These lines were the regiments of Buell's leading division, which, having moved up from Savannah, through a country presenting nothing but interminable swamps and pathless bottomlands, with rank overgrowths of jungle, was arriving at the scene of action breathless, footsore and faint with hunger. It had been a terrible race. Some regiments had lost a third of their number from fatigue, the men dropping from the ranks as if shot, and left to recover or die at their leisure. Nor was the scene to which they had been invited likely to inspire the moral confidence that medicines physical fatigue. True, the air was full of thunder, and the earth was trembling beneath their feet. And, if there is truth in the theory of the conversion of force, these men were storing up energy from every shock that burst its waves upon their bodies. Perhaps this theory may better than another explain the tremendous endurance of men in battle but the eyes reported only matter for despair. Before us ran the turbulent river, vexed with plunging shells and obscured in spots by blue sheets of low-lying smoke. The two little steamers were doing their duty well. They came over to us empty and went back crowded, sitting very low in the water, apparently on the point of capsizing. The farther edge of the water could not be seen. The boats came out of the obscurity, took on their passengers and vanished in the darkness. But on the heights above, the battle was burning brightly enough. A thousand lights kindled and expired in every second of time. There were broad flushings in the sky, against which the branches of the trees showed black. Sudden flames burst out here and there, singly and in dozens. Fleeting streaks of fire crossed over to us by way of welcome. These expired in blinding flashes and fierce little rolls of smoke, attended with the peculiar metallic ring of bursting shells, and followed by the musical humming of the fragments as they struck into the ground on every side, making us wince, but doing little harm. The air was full of noises. To the right and the left, the musketry rattled smartly and petulantly. Directly in front, it sighed and growled. 
To the experienced ear, this meant that the death line was an arc, of which the river was the cord. There were deep, shaking explosions and smart shocks. The whisper of stray bullets and the hurtle of conical shells. The rush of round shot. There were faint, desultory cheers, such as announce a momentary or partial triumph. Occasionally, against the glare behind the trees, could be seen moving black figures, singularly distinct, but apparently no longer than a thumb. They seemed to me ludicrously like the figures of demons, an old allegorical prince of hell. To destroy these and all their belongings, the enemy needed but another hour of daylight. The steamers in that case would have been doing him fine service by bringing more fish to his net. To those of us who had the good fortune to arrive late, could then have eaten our teeth in impotent rage. Nay, to make his victory sure, it did not need that the sun should pause in the heavens. One of the many random shots falling into the river would have done the business had chance directed it into the engine room of a steamer. You can perhaps fancy the anxiety with which we watched them leaping down. But we had two other allies besides the night. Just where the enemy had pushed his right flank to the river was the mouth of a wide bayou, and here two gunboats had taken station. They too were of the toy sort, plated perhaps with railway metals, perhaps with boiler iron. They staggered under a heavy gun or two each. The bayou made an opening in the high bank of the river. The bank was a parapet, behind which the gunboats crouched, firing up the bayou as through an embrasure. The enemy was at this disadvantage. He could not get at the gunboats, and he could advance only by exposing his flank to their ponderous missiles, one of which would have broken a half mile of his bones and made nothing of it. Very annoying this must have been, these twenty gunners beating back an army because a sluggish creek had been pleased to fall into a river at one point rather than another. Such is the part that accident may play in the game of war. As a spectacle, this was rather fine. We could just discern the black bodies of these boats, looking very much like turtles. But when they let off their big guns, there was a conflagration. The river shuddered in its banks and hurried on, bloody, wounded, terrified. Objects a mile away sprang toward our eyes as a snake strikes at the face of its victim. The report stung us to the brain, but we blessed it audibly and we could hear the great shell tearing away through the air until the sound died out in the distance. Then, a surprisingly long time afterward, a dull, distant explosion and a sudden silence of small arms told their own tale. 4. There was, I remember, no elephant on the boat that passed us across that evening, nor, I think, any hippopotamus. These would have been out of place. We had, however, a woman, whether the baby was somewhere on board, I did not learn. She was a fine creature, this woman, somebody's wife. Her mission, as I understood it, was to inspire the failing heart with courage, and when she selected mine, I felt less flattered by her preference than astonished by her penetration. How did she learn? She stood on the upper deck, with the red blaze of battle bathing her beautiful face. The twinkle of a thousand rifles mirrored in her eyes, and displaying a small ivory-handled pistol. She told me in a sentence, punctuated by the thunder of great guns, that if it came to the worst, she would do her duty like a man. I am proud to remember that I took off my hat to this little fool. 5. Along the sheltered strip of beach between the river bank and the water was a confused mass of humanity, several thousands of men. They were mostly unarmed. Many were wounded, some dead. All the camp-following tribes were there. All the cowards, a few officers. Not one of them knew where his regiment was, nor if he had a regiment. Many had not. These men were defeated, beaten, cowed. They were deaf to duty and dead to shame. A more demented crew never drifted to the rear of broken battalions. They would have stood in their tracks and been shot down to a man by a provost marshal's guard, but they could not have been urged up that bank. An army's bravest men are its cowards, the death which they would not meet at the hands of the enemy 
they will meet at the hands of their officers with never a flinching. Whenever a steamboat would land, this abominable mob had to be kept off her with bayonets. When she pulled away, they sprang on her and were pushed by scores into the water, where they were suffered to drown one another in their own way. The men disembarking insulted them, shoved them, struck them. In return, they expressed their unholy delight in the certainty of our destruction by the enemy. By the time my regiment had reached the plateau, night had put an end to the struggle. A sputter of rifles would break out now and then, followed perhaps by a spiritless hurrah. Occasionally a shell from a faraway battery would come pitching down somewhere near, with a whirr crescendo, or flit above our heads with a whisper, like that made by the wings of a nightbird, to smother itself in the river. But there was no more fighting. The gunboats, however, blazed away at set intervals all night long, just to make the enemy uncomfortable and break him of his rest. For us there was no rest. Foot by foot we moved through the dusky fields. We knew not whither. There were men all about us, but no campfires. To have made a blaze would have been madness. The men were of strange regiments. They mentioned the names of unknown generals. They gathered in groups by the wayside, asking eagerly our numbers. They recounted the depressing incidents of the day. A thoughtful officer shut their mouths with a sharp word as he passed. A wise one coming after encouraged them to repeat their doleful tale all along the line. Hidden in hollows and behind clumps of rank brambles were large tents, dimly lighted with candles, but looking comfortable. The kind of comfort they supplied was indicated by pairs of men entering and reappearing, bearing litters, by low moans from within and by long rows of dead with covered faces outside. These tents were constantly receiving the wounded, yet were never full. They were continually ejecting the dead, yet were never empty. It was as if the helpless had been carried in and murdered that they might not hamper those whose business it was to fall tomorrow. The night was now black dark. As is usual after a battle, it had begun to rain. Still we moved. We were being put into position by somebody. Inch by inch we crept along, treading on one another's heels by way of keeping together. Commands were passing along the line in whispers. More commonly, none were given. When the men had pressed so closely together that they could advance no farther, they stood stock still, sheltering the locks of their rifles with their ponchos. In this position, many fell asleep. When those in front suddenly stepped away, those in the rear, roused by the tramping, hastened after with such zeal that the line was soon choked again. Evidently the head of the division was being piloted at a snail's pace by someone who did not feel sure of his ground. Very often we struck our feet against the dead, more frequently against those who still had spirit enough to resent it with a moan. These were lifted carefully to one side and abandoned. Some had sense enough to ask in their weak way for water. <laughs> Absurd. Their clothes were soaken, their hair dank, their white faces, dimly discernible, were clammy and cold. Besides, none of us had any water. There was plenty coming, though, for before midnight a thunderstorm broke upon us with great violence. The rain, which had for hours been a dull drizzle, fell with a copiousness that stifled us. We moved in running water up to our ankles. Happily, we were in a forest of great trees, heavily decorated with Spanish moss. Or, with an enemy standing to his guns, the disclosures of the lightning might have been inconvenient. As it was, the incessant blaze enabled us to consult our watches and encouraged us by displaying our numbers. Our black sinuous line, creeping like a giant serpent beneath the trees, was apparently interminable. I am almost ashamed to say how sweet I found the companionship of those coarse men. So the long night wore away, and as the glimmer of morning crept in through the forest, we found ourselves in a more open country. But where? Not a sign of battle was here. The trees were neither splintered nor scarred. The underbrush was unmown. The ground had no footprint but our own. It was as if we had broken into glades sacred to eternal silence. 
I should not have been surprised to see sleek leopards come fawning about our feet and milk-white deer confront us with human eyes. A few inaudible commands from an invisible leader had placed us in order of battle. But where was the enemy? Where, too, were the riddled regiments that we had come to save? Had our other divisions arrived during the night and passed the river to assist us? Or were we to oppose our paltry five thousand breasts to an army flush with victory? What protected our right? Who lay upon our left? Was there really anything in our front? There came, borne to us on the raw morning air, the long, weird note of a bugle. It was directly before us. It rose with a low, clear, deliberate warble, and seemed to float in the gray sky like the note of a lark. The bugle calls of the Federal and Confederate armies were the same. It was the assembly. As it died away, I observed that the atmosphere had suffered a change. Despite the equilibrium established by the storm, it was electric. Wings were growing on blistered feet, bruised muscles and jolted bones, shoulders pounded by the cruel knapsack, eyes leaden from lack of sleep. All were pervaded by the subtle fluid. All were unconscious of their clay. The men thrust forward their heads, expanded their eyes and clenched their teeth. They breathed hard, as if throttled by tugging at the leash. If you had laid your hand in the beard or hair of one of these men, it would have crackled and shot sparks. 6. I suppose the country lying between Corinth and Pittsburgh Landing could boast a few inhabitants other than alligators. What manner of people they were, it is impossible to say, inasmuch as the fighting dispersed or possibly exterminated them. Perhaps in merely classing them as non-Saurian, I shall describe them with sufficient particularity and, at the same time, avert from myself the natural suspicion attached to a writer who points out to persons who do not know him the peculiarities of persons whom he does not know. One thing, however, I hope I may without offense affirm of these swamp dwellers. They were pious. To what deity their veneration was given, whether, like the Egyptians, they worshipped the crocodile, or, like other Americans, adored themselves, I do not presume to guess. But whoever or whatever may have been the divinity whose ends they shaped, unto him or it they had builded a temple. This humble edifice, centrally situated in the heart of a solitude, and conveniently accessible to the supersylvan crow, had been christened Shiloh Chapel, whence the name of the battle. The fact that a Christian church, assuming it to have been a Christian church, giving name to a wholesale cutting of Christian throats by Christian hands, need not be dwelt on here. The frequency of its reoccurrence in the history of our species has somewhat abated the moral interest that would otherwise attach to it. 7. Owing to the darkness, the storm and the absence of a road, it had been impossible to move the artillery from the open ground about the landing. The privation was much greater in a moral than in a material sense. The infantry soldier feels a confidence in this cumbrous arm, quite unwarranted by its actual achievements in thinning out the opposition. There is something that inspires confidence in the way a gun dashes up to the front, shoving fifty or a hundred men to one side, as if it said, Permit me. Then it squares its shoulders, calmly dislocates a joint in its back, sends away its twenty-four legs and settles down with a quiet rattle, which says as plainly as possible, I've come to stay. There is a superb scorn in this grimly defiant attitude. With its nose in the air, it appears not so much to threaten the enemy as to ride him. Our batteries were probably toiling after us somewhere. We could only hope the enemy might delay his attack until they should arrive. He may delay his defense if he like, said a sententious young officer, to whom I had imparted this natural wish. He had read the signs all right. The words were hardly spoken when a group of staff officers about the brigade commander shot away in divergent lines as if scattered by a whirlwind, and galloping each to the commander of a regiment gave the word. There was a momentary confusion of tongues. A thin line of skirmishers detached itself from the compact front and pushed forward followed by its diminutive reserves of half a company each, one of which platoons it was my fortune to command. 
When the straggling line of skirmishers had swept four or five hundred yards ahead, See, said one of my comrades, she moves. She did indeed, and in fine style, her front as straight as a string, her reserve regiments and columns doubled on the center, following in true subordination, no braying of brass to apprise the enemy, no fifing and drumming to amuse him, no ostentation of gaudy flags, no nonsense. This was a matter of business. In a few moments we had passed out of the singular oasis that had so marvelously escaped the desolation of battle, and now the evidences of the previous day's struggle were present in profusion. The ground was tolerably level here, the forest less dense, mostly clear of undergrowth, and occasionally opening out into small natural meadows. Here and there were small pools, mere disks of rainwater with a tinge of blood. Riven and torn with cannon shot, the trunks of the trees protruded bunches of splinters like hands, the fingers above the wound interlacing with those below. Large branches had been lopped and hung their green heads to the ground or swung critically in their netting of vines as in a hammock. Many had been cut clean off and their masses of foliage seriously impeded the progress of the troops. The bark of these trees, from the root upward, to a height of ten or twenty feet, was so thickly pierced with bullets and grape that one could not have laid a hand on it without covering several punctures. None had escaped. How the human body survives a storm like this must be explained by the fact that it is exposed to it but a few moments at a time, whereas these grand old trees had no one to take their places. From the rising to the going down of the sun, angular bits of iron, concavo, convex, sticking in the sides of muddy depressions, showed where shells had exploded in their furrows. Knapsacks, canteens, haversacks, distended with soaken and swollen biscuits, gaping to disgorge, blankets beaten into the soil by the rain, rifles with bent barrels or splintered stocks, waist belts, hats, and the omnipresent sardine box, all the wretched debris of that battle still littered the spongy earth as far as one could see, in every direction. Dead horses were everywhere. A few disabled caissons, or limbers, reclining on one elbow, as it were. Ammunition wagons, standing disconsolate behind four or six sprawling mules. Men? There were men enough. All dead, apparently, except one, who lay near where I had halted my platoon, to await the slower movement of the line. A federal sergeant, variously hurt, who had been a fine giant in his time. He lay face upward, taking in his breath in convulsive rattling snorts, and blowing it out in sputters of froth, which crawled creamily down his cheeks, piling itself along his neck and ears. A bullet had clipped a groove in his skull, above the temple. From this the brain protruded in bosses, dropping off in flakes and strings. I had not previously known one could get on, even in this unsatisfactory fashion, with so little brain. One of my men, whom I knew for a womanish fellow, asked if he should put his bayonet through him. Inexpressibly shocked by the cold-blooded proposal, I told him I thought not. It was unusual, and too many were looking. 8. It was plain that the enemy had retreated to Corinth. The arrival of our fresh troops and their successful passage of the river had disheartened him. Three or four of his gray cavalry vedettes, moving amongst the trees on the crest of a hill in our front and galloping out of sight at the crack of our skirmishers' rifles, confirmed us in the belief. An army face to face with its enemy does not employ cavalry to watch its front. True, they might be a general and his staff. Crowning this, we found a level field, a quarter of a mile in width, Beyond it a gentle acclivity, covered with an undergrowth of young oaks, impervious to sight. We pushed on into the open, but the division halted at the edge. Having orders to conform to its movements, we halted too. But that did not suit. We received an intimation to proceed. I had performed this sort of service before, and in the exercise of my discretion deployed my platoon, pushing it forward at a run, with trailed arms, 
to strengthen the skirmish line, which I overtook some thirty or forty yards from the wood. Then, I can't describe it, the force seemed all at once to flame up and disappear, with a crash like that of a great wave upon the beach, a crash that expired in hot hissings, and the sickening spat of lead against flesh. A dozen of my brave fellows tumbled over like tenpins. Some struggled to their feet, only to go down again, and yet again. Those who stood fired into the smoking brush and doggedly retired. We had expected to find, at most, a line of skirmishers similar to our own. It was with a view to overcoming them by a sudden coup at the moment of collision that I had thrown forward my little reserve. What we had found was a line of battle, coolly holding its fire till it could count our teeth. There was no more to be done but get back across the open ground, every superficial yard of which was throwing up its little jet of mud provoked by an impinging bullet. We got back, most of us, and I shall never forget the ludicrous incident of a young officer who had taken part in the affair walking up to his colonel, who had been a calm and apparently impartial spectator, and gravely reporting, The enemy is in force just beyond this field, sir. 9. In subordination to the design of this narrative, as defined by its title, the incidents related necessarily group themselves about my own personality as a center, and, as this center, during the few terrible hours of the engagement, maintained a variably constant relation to the open field already mentioned. It is important that the reader should bear in mind the topographical and tactical features of the local situation. The hither side of the field was occupied by the front of my brigade, a length of two regiments in line with proper intervals for field batteries. During the entire fight, the enemy held the slight wooded acclivity beyond. The debatable ground to the right and left of the open was broken and thickly wooded for miles, and some places quite inaccessible to artillery, and at very few points offering opportunities for its successful employment. As a consequence of this, the two sides of the field were soon studded thickly with confronting guns which flamed away at one another with amazing zeal and rather startling effect. Of course, an infantry attack delivered from either side was not to be thought of when the covered flanks offered inducements so unquestionably superior. And I believe the riddled bodies of my poor skirmishers were the only ones left on this neutral ground that day. But there was a very pretty line of dead continually growing in our rear, and doubtless the enemy had at his back a similar encouragement. The configuration of the ground offered us no protection. By lying flat on our faces between the guns, we were screened from view by a straggling row of brambles, which marked the course of an obsolete fence. But the enemy's grape was sharper than his eyes, and it was poor consolation to know that his gunners could not see what they were doing so long as they did it. The shock of our own pieces nearly deafened us, but in the brief intervals we could hear the battle roaring and stammering in the dark reaches of the forest to the right and left, where our other divisions were dashing themselves again and again into the smoking jungle. What would we not have given to join them in their brave, hopeless task? But to lie inglorious beneath showers of shrapnel, darting divergent from the unassailable sky, meekly to be blown out of life by level gusts of grape, to clench our teeth and shrink helpless before big shot, pushing noisily through the consenting air. This was horrible. Lie down there, a captain would shout, and then get up himself to see that his order was obeyed. Captain, take cover, sir, the lieutenant colonel would shriek, pacing up and down in the most exposed position that he could find. Oh, those cursed guns. Not the enemy's, but our own. Had it not been for them, we might have died like men. They must be supported, forsooth, the feeble, boasting bullies. It was impossible to conceive that these pieces were doing the enemy as excellent a mischief as his were doing us. They seemed to raise their cloud by day, solely to direct aright the streaming procession of Confederate missiles. They no longer inspired confidence, but begot apprehension. And it was with grim satisfaction that I saw the carriage of one and another smashed into matchwood by a whooping shot and bundled out of the line. 10. 
The dense forests, wholly or partly in which were fought so many battles of the Civil War, lay upon the earth in each autumn a thick deposit of dead leaves and stems, the decay of which forms a soil of surprising depth and richness. In dry weather, the upper stratum is as inflammable as tinder. A fire once kindled in it will spread with a slow, persistent advance as far as local conditions permit, leaving a bed of light ashes, beneath which the less combustible accretions of previous years will smolder until extinguished by rains. In many of the engagements of the war, the fallen leaves took fire and roasted the fallen men. At Shiloh, during the first day's fighting, wide tracts of woodland were burned over in this way, and scores of wounded, who might have recovered, perished in slow torture. I remember a deep ravine, a little to the left and rear of the field I have described, in which, by some mad freak of heroic incompetence, a part of an Illinois regiment had been surrounded, and refusing to surrender was destroyed, as it very well deserved. My regiment, having at last been relieved at the guns, and moved over to the heights above this ravine for no obvious purpose, I obtained leave to go down into the valley of death and gratify a reprehensible curiosity. Forbidding enough it was every day. The fire had swept every superficial foot of it, and at every step I sank into ashes to the ankle. It had contained a thick undergrowth of young saplings, every one of which had been severed by a bullet, the foliage of the prostrate tops being afterward burnt and the stumps charred. Death had put his sickle into this thicket, and fire had gleaned the field, along a line which was not that of extreme depression, but was at every point significantly equidistant from the heights on either hand, lay the bodies, half buried in ashes, some in the unlovely looseness of attitude denoting sudden death by a bullet, but by far the greater number in postures of agony that told of the tormenting flame. Their clothing was half burnt away, their hair and beard entirely. The rain had come too late to save their nails. Some were swollen to double girth, others shriveled to mannequins. According to degree of exposure, their faces were bloated and black or yellow and shrunken. The contraction of muscles which had given them claws for hands had cursed each countenance with a hideous grin. <laughs> I cannot catalog the charms of these gallant gentlemen who had got what they enlisted for. 11. It was now three o'clock in the afternoon, and raining. For fifteen hours we had been wet to the skin, chilled, sleepy, hungry and disappointed, profoundly disgusted with the inglorious part to which they had been condemned. The men of my regiment did everything doggedly. The spirit had gone quite out of them. Blue sheets of powder smoke, drifting amongst the trees, settling against the hillsides, and beaten into nothingness by the falling rain, filled the air with their peculiar pungent odor. But it no longer stimulated. For miles on either hand could be heard the hoarse murmur of the battle, breaking out nearby with frightful distinctness or sinking to a murmur in the distance, and the one sound aroused no more attention than the other. We had been placed again in rear of those guns, but even they and their iron antagonists seemed to have tired of their feud, pounding away at one another with amiable infrequency. The right of the regiment extended a little beyond the field. On the prolongation of the line in that direction were some regiments of another division, with one in reserve. A third of a mile back lay the remnant of somebody's brigade looking to its wounds. The line of force bounding this end of the field stretched as straight as a wall from the right of my regiment to heaven knows what regiment of the enemy. There suddenly appeared, marching down along this wall, not more than two hundred yards in our front, a dozen files of gray-clad men with rifles on the right shoulder. At an interval of fifty yards they were followed by perhaps half as many more, and in fair supporting distance of these, stalked with confident mane, a single man. There seemed to me something indescribably ludicrous in the advance of this handful of men upon an army, albeit with their left flank protected by a forest. It does not so impress me now. They were the exposed flanks of three lines of infantry, 
each a half mile in length. In a moment, our gunners had grappled with the nearest pieces, swung them half round, and were pouring streams of canister into the invaded wood. The infantry rose in masses, springing into line. Our threatened regiments stood like a wall, their loaded rifles at ready, their bayonets hanging quietly in the scabbards. The right wing of my own regiment was thrown slightly backward to threaten the flank of the assault. The battered brigade, away to the rear, pulled itself together. Then the storm burst. A great gray cloud seemed to spring out of the forest into the faces of the waiting battalions. It was received with a crash that made the very trees turn up their leaves. For one instant the assailants paused above their dead, then struggled forward, their bayonets glittering in the eyes that shone behind the smoke. One moment and those unmoved men in blue would be impaled. What were they about? Why did they not fix bayonets? Were they stunned by their own volley? Their inaction was maddening. Another tremendous crash. The rear rank had fired. Humanity, thank heaven, is not made for this. And the shattered gray mass drew back a score of paces, opening a feeble fire. Lead had scored its old-time victory over steel. The heroic had broken its great heart against the commonplace. There are those who say that it is sometimes otherwise. All this had taken but a minute of time, and now the second Confederate line swept down and poured in its fire. The line of blue staggered and gave way. In those two terrific volleys, it seemed to have quite poured out its spirit. To this deadly work, our reserve regiment now came up with a run. It was surprising to see it spitting fire with never a sound, for such was the infernal din that the ear could take in no more. This fearful scene was enacted within fifty paces of our toes, but we were rooted to the ground as if we had grown there. But now our commanding officer rode from behind us to the front, waved his hand with the courteous gesture that says, Après vous, and with a barely audible cheer we sprang into the fight. Again the smoking front of gray receded, and again as the enemy's third line emerged from its leafy covert, it pushed forward across the piles of dead and wounded, to threaten with protruded steel. Never was seen so striking a proof of the paramount importance of numbers. Within an area of three hundred yards by fifty, there struggled for front places no fewer than six regiments, and the accession of each, after the first collision, had it not been immediately counterpoised, would have turned the scale. As matters stood, we were now very evenly matched, and how long we might have held out God only knows. But all at once something appeared to have gone wrong with the enemy's left. Our men had somewhere pierced his line. A moment later his whole front gave way, and springing forward with fixed bayonets, we pushed him in utter confusion back to his original line. Here among the tents from which Grant's people had been expelled the day before, our broken and disordered regiments inextricably intermingled, and drunken with the wine of triumph, dashed confidently against a pair of trim battalions, provoking a tempest of hissing lead that made us stagger under its very weight. The sharp onset of another against our flank sent us whirling back with fire at our heels and fresh foes in merciless pursuit, who in their turn were broken upon the front of the invalided brigade previously mentioned, which had moved up from the rear to assist in this lively work. As we rallied to reform behind our beloved guns, and noted the ridiculous brevity of our line, as we sank from sheer fatigue and tried to moderate the terrific thumping of our hearts, as we caught our breath to ask who had seen such and such a comrade and laughed hysterically at the reply, there swept past us and over us into the open field a long regiment with fixed bayonets and rifles on the right shoulder. Another followed and another. Two, three, four. Heavens! Where do all these men come from, and why did they not come before? How grandly and confidently they go sweeping on like long blue waves of ocean, chasing one another to the cruel rocks. Involuntarily we drew in our weary feet beneath us as we sit, ready to spring up and interpose our breasts when these gallant lines shall come back to us across the terrible field and sift brokenly through among the trees with sprouting fires at their backs. We still are breathing to catch the full grandeur of the volleys 
that are to tear them to shreds. Minute after minute passes, and the sound does not come. Then, for the first time, we note that the silence of the whole region is not comparative, but absolute. Have we become stone deaf? See, here comes a stretcher bearer, and there, a surgeon. Good heavens, a chaplain. The battle was indeed at an end. 12. And this was, oh, so long ago. How they come back to me, dimly and brokenly, but with what a magic spell. Those years of youth when I was soldiering. Again I hear the far warble of blown bugles. Again I see the tall blue smoke of campfires ascending from the dim valleys of Wonderland. There steals upon my sense the ghost of an odor from pines, that canopy of ambuscade. I feel upon my cheek the morning mist that shrouds the hostile camp, unaware of its doom, and my blood stirs at the ringing rifle shot of the solitary sentinel. Unfamiliar landscapes, glittering with sunshine or sullen with rain, come to me demanding recognition. Pass, vanish, and give place to others. Here in the night stretches a wide and blasted field, studded with half-extinct fires burning redly with I know not what presage of evil. Again I shudder as I note its desolation and its awful silence. Where was it? To what monstrous inharmony of death was it the visible prelude? O oh, days when all the world was beautiful and strange, when unfamiliar constellations burned in the southern midnights, and the mockingbird poured out its heart in the moon-gilded magnolia, when there was something new under a new sun, will your fine, far memories ever cease to lay contrasting pictures athwart the harsher features of this latter world, accentuating the ugliness with the longer and tamer life? Is it not strange that the phantoms of a blood-stained period have so airy a grace and look with so tender eyes? That I recall with difficulty the danger and death and horrors of the time, and without effort, all that was gracious and picturesque? Ah, youth, there is no such wizard as thou. Give me but one touch of thine artist hand upon the dull canvas of the present. Gild for but one moment the drear and somber scenes of today, and I will willingly surrender another life than the one that I should have thrown away at Shiloh.